Yeah. All right. Well, I will kick it off to Cal then. So welcome to, you know, our Zoom, Raising the Glass. So just to let you guys know, um, we do record it. So it's going to be, and then we put it up on our Winebow YouTube. And then this is so we can share it with people. Um, accounts can view it. So it's going to be a great um, resource for everybody. So thank you guys for joining us. And with that, I'll kick it over to Calvin. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to have some stragglers rolling in in the next like five, usually like by 5.15, we kind of we kind of fill out a little bit as people who are not acquainted with technology <laughs> figure out how to hit a link and get on. So while that happens, um, we're here. Uh, it's called Raising the Glass. It's just a platform for us to engage the trade, our sales team, and ourselves um, and become more acquainted with our brands, our suppliers, and talk a little bit about what you do. So we are here with Erica and Amanda. Um, Amanda, tell, tell us a little bit about your background and what you do for Virginia Distillery. Yeah, thanks so much for having us today. I get to wear a lot of hats with Virginia Distillery Company. One of my main hats is education, so I'm the guest experience and education manager. I also do a lot of the blending here, so barrels are my second home, and I thought it'd be fun to show you guys a little bit of that today. And yeah, I have a little video to kick things off if you'd like me to go ahead and share my screen. That'd be amazing. Okay. So this is just a quick PowerPoint. I thought it'd be fun to take you through our world since you can't see it all right now in person. Um, this is kind of just a little video of the grounds, everything that's going on in our, our world. So uh, right now, I don't know if you guys can hear the volume. It's been a little funny today, so I'll just talk over it. But this is this is our property. We're on 100 acres. Most of it is wooded, and uh, we really love just the ability to just showcase all the things that we have education-wise. So right now we have uh, a visitor center. With uh, usually we love opening it to the public, so people can come in. They can tour and see our distilling firsthand. We're the largest American single malt producer by volume and we're the largest independently owned American single malt producer. So what single malt is, it's a whiskey distilled from one grain, always malted barley at a single distillery. And so we distill, age, bottle, all on site. And uh, we have a really fantastic team and they're still working almost around the clock. We're in seven days a week still. We've taken a little hiatus at times to make sanitizer, which we've been donating to local first responders, nearby hospitals, the SBCA. So that's been really great. Um, but what we do is we distill in copper pot stills. So you can see we use double distillation. And the whole process takes about three days of fermentation plus another day of the uh, Milling, mashing, and actual distillation before it can go into barrels. So it's a it's a full operation. And then the reason I'm up here in a warehouse full of barrels and showing you lots of video of barrels is this is really our our secret fourth ingredient: time and barrels. And we we think a lot of the flavor that goes into the whiskey comes from the aging process in the barrels. So that's pretty crucial. We also have a beautiful bottling house. So after we collect our barrels, we can take people in there and showcase all the fun we have bottling. Uh, most of our team takes a turn bottling and it keeps us very busy. <laughs> uh, I'll talk more about our product line in a minute and even do a little virtual tasting. So that should be a lot of fun. And yeah, that is my, my little video right there. So cool. Now before Virginia Distillery, what was your background? Where did you come from and how did you become acquainted with this company? Yes, uh, I started out, well, I always loved whiskey. I loved traveling. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna close this out. <laughs> there we go. YouTube kept going on me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I started out at the Virginia Aquarium doing admissions there, and uh, I was an English major. It was just my dream as a kid to work at a, an aquarium, and so I, I found I loved working with the public, and I loved education. I loved being able to bring people in and show them a lot of things, and so I, I moved to Charlottesville. I was going through the uh, doctoral program at UVA and decided I wasn't ready to really commit my life to that process and I heard about a little distillery about to open making single malt and it was bigger more beautiful more wonderful than I had imagined so I just fell in love with it right off the bat and uh, they brought me in to do the guest experience to create a visitor center and a tour and tasting program so we did that got it up and running back in 2015 
And then from there, it was kind of a, oh, we, we can do other things. We can move you into education and blending. So I got to train with Nancy Fraley. She's a, a nosing expert, a blender who has worked all over the world, trained in cognac, and uh, she's been a wonderful mentor. And then I also got to work with Dr. Jim Swan, a maturation expert, before he passed away in 2017. Wow. And uh, yeah, he, he was a gift. And um uh, gave us a lot of really great insights here at the distillery. And then also uh, Harry Coburn, 83 years old, wonderful mentor. He lives in Scotland, but he still checks in and we can send him samples. And I ping him almost monthly for weird whiskey questions and he never lets me down. So <laughs> I've been very fortunate. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like a pretty amazing position you have. Like aside from investment bankers and like tech <laughs> guys, teachers are like the biggest boozers I know. So like, <laughs> I don't know how you're hanging, but it sounds like you're doing great. <laughs> Thank uh, you. That's amazing. So what are some of the most surprising questions or the, the most surprising interactions you have when you're doing education on not just single malt, but American single malt, which is like yes. a, a growing category, but most people are like, what? <laughs> flavor. People are fascinated by the flavor profiles of single malt because sometimes a person's first experience with single malt might be a peated whiskey from Scotland, like an Isla Lagavulin and Lafroy, and they just immediately think that's what all single malt is like. So finding out their regions of single malt all over the world, not just in Scotland, that are really amazing surprises people. So they usually dig in right there first, and they're very curious about what to expect from an American single malt. Wow, that's so cool. Erica, I know you said you were going to be here anonymously, but since I can see your face, would you like to introduce yourself to our, uh, to our team and to the, the viewers joining us? Sure. I'm Erica Crapel. I am the Northeast Market Manager for Virginia Distillery Company. So I handle Massachusetts down to New Jersey and all in between. And I know many of the Winebow crew, fortunately, having been with the company for two years now. But I am always happy to meet more faces and work with those when we can. Uh, I am local, so that's easy enough to to always have access to me, um, but text and email work as well. And any question that I can't answer, Amanda can answer. So then I always defer to her and get whatever information we need. <laughs> any time of day, almost <laughs> within reason. Um, we love talking whiskey. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but well, I look forward to getting back to whatever our new normal will be whenever that is. And we'll all hit the streets again. Yeah, well, I'm sure it's gonna include a lot of this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> responsibly, though, responsibly. All right, I'll, I'll bring some uh, straws. We'll just drop them in and... <laughs> straws, right? Straws. <laughs> um, that's an inside joke me and Erica have. <laughs> so, Amanda, tell us more about production. Tell us about the history of, uh, of yes. the distillery. Um, how did you guys start? And, why, and why, why choose such a small category right now, but a booming category? Yes. I'm gonna just make bourbon and rye and... Vodka. Absolutely. Yeah, I will share my screen again and talk a little bit about the uh, the founder, Dr. George Moore. He was an Irishman who loved single malt whiskey. He came over from Ireland on a scholarship to George Washington University back in the 70s, and he fell in love with Virginia. He eventually ended up working in the caller ID world. The, the tech industry was really uh, booming, and so he, he got into a lot of success there, helped to um, grow a lot of businesses. And then as soon as he could, he moved his family right back to Virginia. And his one passion through all of his years was collecting and drinking single malts. He had a, a single malt for every day of the year. And sadly, um, the height of his collection was 365 bottles. Apparently his daughter liked to uh, throw parties and one day gave away a lot of bottles and opened a lot of bottles. So his one thing that he wanted was an American single malt that he could share with friends and family. And because there just wasn't one at that time, he had the idea, let me make that happen. So he found mentors, uh, the best of the best in the industry, got some beautiful equipment brought in. And uh, by 2015, we were able to start distilling our American single malt. And he sadly passed away a few years ago. His son, Gareth, has taken over the reins. He's our CEO and is a fantastic leader for our, our company. And uh, when it came time to pick a name for our single malt, we were thinking back of all the things that Dr. Moore would say, and he had the saying, have the courage of your convictions. And we thought, well, that's what really propelled him to be a visionary in the American single malt category. And we picked that uh, for 
the name of our single malt line. So Courage and Conviction is, is kind of who we are. And it's been cool because even in this time with all the, the craziness going on, a lot of people are saying that really resonates with them. They'll walk into a liquor store and see that and their hand is just out there grabbing it before they've even thought twice. Wow. I mean, that's really inspiring. And it definitely resonates with what we need in the world right now. It's a really crazy time. So I'm not saying you planned it. I'm just saying it's really cool, funny coincidence. Yeah, finding the silver lining. That's what we're yeah. calling it. Yeah. For sure. Um, talk a little bit about the line, because Courage and Conviction right. is the flagship. It's where you guys are uh, moving towards. But you guys came out with a, yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. And I've got a bigger picture, too. There we go. So it's really been a decade of planning and years and years of aging and getting everything right. But we, we kind of have a unique recipe for this whiskey. So again, water, yeast, and barley for an American single malt, but we age in three different types of barrels. We use about 50% former bourbon barrels. And so that's what you see behind me. They bring a lot of the, the foundational notes, the caramel, vanilla, toffee, toasted oak, a little bit of cinnamon and barrel spice. And uh, in fact, I'm going to pause this, stop my share, and I'm going to take you on a tour through the barrels, if that would be fun for you guys. Amazing. Let's All take right. a walk. <laughs> I'm going to mute this right here, and then uh, my wonderful coworker, Greg, is going to do the video work while I tour. Mute, hey? Oh, here we need to mute that now. Why did you all that? That was exciting. <laughs> all right. Can, can you guys hear us? Perfect. Good. Fabulous. All right. So a little bit of a uh, tour. We have two large cask houses. They can each hold over 6,000 barrels in a full. And going back to the recipe for Courage and Conviction American Single Malt, about 50% of the barrels aging our whiskey for are these former bourbon barrels. So their first life in Kentucky at uh, Brown Foreman Distilleries, like with the Reserve, they held bourbon for several years. But a lot of bourbon was aged in New Charto, and so they can't do anything with those barrels that we've done except sell or give them away. So we happily buy them, and we use them to age our single malt. So these are 53 gallons. Uh, they, they're used oak, so second fill as is, is a down the road, but this is like what we call first fill bourbons. All right. So roughly 25% of the whiskey that we have each first single malt is in these beautiful casks over here. Our name for them is Cuvée Casks. Our brand director, Marlene Steiner, gave it that name. And it's a really a, a connotation for the, the quality of the, the whiskey and the wine that was in it before. So Cuvée doesn't technically mean uh, much in, in any of it does in terms of quality and premium nature. So the cool thing about these barrels is they have a premium red wine blend from Spain in their first life. Then the barrel states were taken apart, shaved, toasted, given a quick char, and then recoupered back together. So if you're tasting our whiskey and you get some beautiful milk chocolate notes, with some bright cheer, your raspberry notes, I like to put it these barrels with those. And our mental doctor, Ben Swan, is the one who told us, you know, you've got a really unique climate here in Virginia, so you've got to find barrels that work with it. And uh, so, yeah, he, he recommended this type of barrel to only a small handful of distilleries, so we're hopefully fortunate there. Take you further back. And uh, something fascinating, in spring and summer in the old world, say Scotland or Ireland, barrels take the Spain, it's a slow warming of the season. And then in fall and winter, there's a slow contraction. So it is very intense. And so we have this expanding and contracting multiple times, even in one day. We're hitting very cold nights. Um, we have the frost warnings and dipping down really low and then working 90 or even above in the afternoon sometimes. So we're having this breathing in and out. And it's giving color, flavor, uh, lots of complexity and depth of aroma. Really naturally, we don't petite barrel age. We don't use caramel coloring for our single malt, nothing like that. It's just all because of the barrel and uh, the, the weather, the climate impacts. There is a heartbreaking side, and that is the fact that we have evaporation process. So while in Scotland, that gradual aging might give you one to two percent loss of the single share a year, we can have six, eight, 12, even higher percentage of loss every year from the barrel. So it is pretty heartbreaking. You take the good and the bad. All right. Jeez. We have sensors placed throughout the distillery so we can get readings on things like humidity levels and evaporation rates. So that's what that is. We get lots of them. 
And then here in the back, we have our Fino, Oloroso, and Pedro Jimenez. And these are all the beautiful fairy castles that came from Spain. And uh, we took them over, filled them up with our whiskey, and there you have it. I'm going to walk back and come over for a little tasting of this event. Questions so far? So, where do you guys get your sherry butts from? Here, you know what? Um, give me one sec. I can't hear you guys. Lots of volume, so we'll yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. There's also a lot of fans, so I'll get away from that. All right. I don't know if it's... So, this one is still filling up. We have another cask house right beside it. We uh, also quite a few barrels in there, and we're continuing to do barrels in almost every week to fill up the space. So, before long, we'll be working in our third barrel house, which is pretty exciting. Wow. Cool. Okay, we can hear you now. Fabulous. Yeah, yeah. So, so I wanted to ask you guys, um, where do you guys get your sh sherry butts and about how old are your sherry butts? Oh, yeah. There's a big variety. We have a uh, Spanish cooper that we work with. Actually, we work with several in Spain and Portugal. One of my favorites is J.D. is, but we, we send over a request and we say, this is how many we want. The really important thing to us is that the barrels are never dry for transport, so we like to retain about 14% to 18% liquid in the barrels. Nice. And they're shipped over, we get them to Norfolk, and then they're driven in, and we very quickly fill them. We don't like much turnaround time to go wasted, so yeah. Wow. Having a good relationship with the Cooperages makes all the difference in the world. That's amazing. So you're saying you guys can get over 12% up to even higher, of evaporation. Yes. Have you yeah. guys thought about finding ways to mitigate that? Is there a way? A you could climate control um, and you could, you could do different things. But for us right now, we're really loving the impacts flavor wise on the whiskey. So we don't want to cut away too much of that. The fascinating thing too is age really is just a number. So it's not a level playing field if you're in Scotland five years is one thing. For us, one year of aging can deliver a whiskey that looks and tastes and smells like a 10-year-old whiskey from Scotland. So we're kind of running with that. And our motto is we let the whiskey tell us when it's ready. So we have a really fascinating process where we're able to pull samples from the barrels all the time and do analysis, say, yes, I think this whiskey is ready. No, this needs more time. We do our prototyping for, for batting for release and off we go. So eventually we might want to find areas that protect the whiskey a little bit more. You get pockets of humidity, you get more intense fluctuations when you're by the door or when you're up high. So but some people really like that and it's value loss. So yeah, it's a big trade off. Yeah. Well, a lot of people say, you know, it's not how long you age something, but how you age it, right? Exactly. Um, age is just a number. <laughs> yeah. So I live my life that way. But right. you know, this is one of those instances where it is more to do with how you're aging than how long something's been in a barrel, you know, and with yes. age statements, you have a lot of consumers that are like, what the age statement? So what I wanted to ask you was, how has not having an age statement helped and how, ha what challenges has not having an age statement? Uh, yeah. That's a good question. I think the challenges come from people who think older is better. And thankfully education is really stripping that in this conceptual way. I think we can trace that back to the 80s when vodka suddenly became king for a while and people, well, distillers in Scotland were saying it'd be more expensive to bottle what I have, let's sit on it. And they put these really long, beautiful age shapes. That made sense for them. They weren't going through much evaporation at all. So there wasn't lost to worry about. And then in the 90s, some of those long age statements, that was something to collect and, and brag about and it became this thing. Um, and so I think people can have had that holding over for a long time. Now we can look at India, Taiwan, and see these beautiful whiskeys coming out that have no age statements and realize we don't need to be hindered by that. So that's really cool. Yeah. I'm sure getting it in the glass too is really important. You get it in the glass. I mean, your stuff <laughs> is bad with a lot of the Japanese stuff that's, that doesn't have an age statement. In my book, in my personal opinion. Thank you. I love Japanese whiskey, so I'll take it. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do, you, how do you have that conversation with scotch drinkers? And what's sort of the gateway for you to bridge that gap and to get them into drinking your whiskey? One of my wonderful experiences with whiskey is just 
so much centered on smelling it, being able to to get to know whiskey. I think they say, you know, 80% sometimes, 90% is, is your sense of smell impacting your sense of taste. And definitely, I mean, the science is back at least 70%. So if you can have somebody share an experience with you over this whiskey, they're going to kind of fall in love. That's what happens to me. So being able to center yourself down, curl up with a dog and a good book and, and this whiskey or have a really great meal where you pair it and you think this is exquisite yeah. or, you know, just a memory made, that that opens up people to the, the wealth of, just uh, specialness in the whiskey. And so if your comfort blanket is, say, scotch, and that's all you've ever tried, just maybe sharing a, an experience that you've had or something to kind of pique their interest, and then they're there. It's been really fun to see people fall in love with American single malts. Yeah. Where do you see American single malts in the next 10, 15, 20 years? Oh, it's exciting. I think it's a really exciting category with a lot of room to grow and we're part of the American Single Malt Commission so we're relatively young but I think our motto really has been a rising tide floats all ships so even though we have totally different climates to work with different uh, barrels used or grain or yeast picked out uh, we're all kind of saying the same message so that's been really fun to see I think there's a lot of excitement building and interest more articles are coming out about it more awards being won so I think in the next decade, American single malt is going to really grow and people will be more familiar with it and excited about just what it is. Yeah. One of the cool things about Scotland is that, you know, all these distilleries in some way, shape or form, form the community, be it regionally, right? Bayside, Isla, the Lowlands, Highlands, yes. right? There's this, there's this sense of like regional community, maybe not necessarily the distillery community, but how, yeah. how have you formed a similar community with other single malt producers? Is there like a, an association being formed? What are some of the yes. laws that are being formed for American single malt in the United States? Yes, so we're waiting on the TTB, the uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, Tax and Trade Bureau to approve the final, these are the, the exact definitions of what single malt is. So we formed the American Single Malt Commission as a way to all sing from the same songbook. And uh, it's been really great my my experience has been really encouraging because we've been able to reach out to each other even through email i was emailing back and forth with several uh leaders in the american single malt community and just asking questions and giving feedback on batting techniques and uh just reducing times and things like that so that's been really cool i have so much love for westland and balcones and so many others strain of hands that have been passionate in doing this for a long time i love st george spirits they do very tiny little releases and i always look forward to their their american single malt coming out so it's a beautiful category with some really great notes and they really do deliver on a sense of place so it's it's fun to be part of that yeah i know there was a time when like napa wines are just smacking around french wines when do you think <laughs> it's going to happen for american single malt to smack around scotch <laughs> I would like that too. All the love for Scotch, but yeah, it's fun to be the new kid on the block in this sense. And yeah. Yeah. Got I'm, a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we? I'm just home team. I'm home team all day. Um, should we do a little bit of tasting? Can you talk us through some of your yes. recipes and how you go about tasting? Absolutely. So these are kind of the three ones that I know Wine Buzz worked a lot with. And so I had to lead with the Courage and Conviction American Single Malt. And Really right here, I love just the nose of it. It's so layered and complex. And I think that even if you let it sit for a little while and then open up and come back to it, get more and more notes. Uh, the barley comes through, there's a nice maltiness. There's some apricots and uh, tropical notes, some cling fruit like peach too. And then it goes right into the bright cherry, raspberry, chocolate. There's just a lot there, and I, I think that's really fun. And yeah, on the palate, all those notes really do come through, and there's some great bacon spice your notes on the finish. The vanilla, the softness is there. So this is one of those whiskeys that I've had people love it in cocktails, want to do a highball or something with it. That's great, but it's, it's a great neat sipping whiskey, and that's how I would enjoy this one for sure. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, next up, we have a cider cask finish. So while we were getting started as a distillery, you know, a lot of distilleries start off with a vodka, a gin, a rum, something to have out the gate immediately. Our cider cask finish and our port cask finish were 
kind of the the idea was let's tell our story with with barley as the grain. So that's our only mash bill. It's always 100% malted barley. We brought over whiskey that had already aged from a distillery in Scotland, and now we add roughly 50% of our own distillate that's been you know aging here for several years. And then instead of just bottling, we move into the second type of barrel to finish. So most of your blended whiskeys, because these are American blended malt whiskeys. Um, Blended whiskeys that people are familiar with would be like Johnny Walker, Dewar's famous Grouse. These all are 30 to 40 different whiskeys coming together to go into the bottle. And most of them are grain whiskeys made in a column still, maybe one or two single malts thrown in. So this is very different. We call it American. So it's just two single malts coming together, uh, spending time in a second cast to really integrate and get some finesse. So the cider cask, we move it into a cider barrel. And so you get a lot of green apple, pear, toasted pecan on the uh, palate, honeysuckle, um, baked apple coming from cinnamon on the finish. It's really great. And uh, Whiskey Advocate ranked it in the top 20 whiskeys last year. So no, two years ago, 18, I don't even know what it is anymore. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was like, yeah, it was like two years ago. You guys were like yeah. nine or something. Yeah, it's it's been really great to, to see the love there for that. And we keep selling it out. And I'm currently working on batch seven for that one. So it's, yeah. it's really fun. I love that whiskey. And then our forecast finish, same concept. Married two whiskeys together. So Amanda, in, when you're doing the cider cast and you're up to batch seven, is there ever a pressure to duplicate the blend of the first batch? I do side by side sometimes. I like that question a lot. We keep prototypes and we'll do comparisons with original batches or former batches for consistency but i like to push myself to always improve from batch to batch so i think it's getting better every batch or at least that's what i hope yeah that's so you're like this is going to get number one yes then number nine. we're working towards number one so what so when you when you do something like that what are some of the things you're looking to improve upon let's say for the cider cast because i love batch one batch two is great as well they're so different quality is amazing but what do you feel is improving upon something that was so great to begin with? Yes. Well, one of the things that has been easier is the longer we have been distilling, the, the more stock we have, the older the whiskey. So we have more to choose from and play with. So that's been great, just having more ingredients, in a sense, to go into the recipe, which is really helpful. Uh, I think also learning what to expect from different barrels has been a good tool. So saying, OK. I think a good whiskey offers certain things. A long finish is great for certain whiskeys, having a lot of complexity so you can see, I'm getting notes from all these different things. I'm getting the malt notes, the fermentation notes, the barrel notes, all those things coming together. So I'm looking for barrels that really sing and say, there's something special about this. Yeah. Is there ever a blend you make that you're like, well, that's not gonna see the light of day. Like, uh -huh. <laughs> Thankfully, no blends. There have been one or two barrels that I've bought that, you know, how do I save this? Because it's, yeah, <laughs> it's not doing its thing on its own. And, you know, there's there's something to be learned from it, so I'm, I'm grateful for it. We are experimenting a lot of times on different crazy barrels. They're in the other warehouse, so they're hidden away. But yeah. I think I think we're going to call some of those the store selects, so you might see them coming out in very special limited ones of, say, six or seven barrels at a time in the future. Wow, wow. Yeah. Selfish question, when you're not drinking American single malt, when you clock out, what's the lowest class whiskey you drink? And then what's a spirit that we wouldn't expect you to drink and enjoy? Oh, I have always been one of those people who always wants the best of the best all the time. Oh, um, I, at home, I do drink a lot of our whiskey and I drink a lot of Yamazaki. Uh, so when I clock out, I'm never without those bottles at home. Um, Sometimes, sometimes a mezcal hits the spot, but that's not a whiskey. Um, lowest whiskey. Sometimes I like to have just a, a check on my palate. So I have a friend who sets up blind tastings for me with bourbons and ryes and weeded whiskeys just to kind of see. And uh, so, yeah, sometimes there's, there's a surprise in, in one of those. And Jefferson's Aged at Sea won out last time. So that was a fun surprise. So we'll never catch you sipping on old granddad with like a PBR in a dark corner of some bar in Virginia? Nope, never ever. Sorry. Uh, Red breast happens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, if, there's, if there's something you want to leave us with as far as like um, your philosophy on um, American spirits, what is something that you'd want to say to us as a takeaway? Oh, I like this. 
So I would say my favorite thing that I fell in, fall in love with, and I think it brought me into whiskey, was the connection between culture, history, friendship, memory, all of that. It all kind of comes together. And so much of, of taste and aroma is based on memories and things that you can connect to. So uh, I love the idea of digging in deep and finding a whiskey that lets you do that. I feel like that's true courage and conviction. I think there's a story there and also a lot of complexity to kind of intrigue you. We have a really fun website, batch.info, which my awesome coworker Greg has been working hard to put together. And so if you want to get geeky about a whiskey, find a way to, to really uh, fall down the rabbit hole and have fun. And, and for example, batch.info, you can go and find out how many barrels went into this whiskey yeah. batch and, and all the evaporation rates. So yeah, that's, I think my, my life philosophy is get geeky with it. Yeah. I mean, you guys are so great as far as engaging and packaging and giving us the information. It's really beautiful to see. Um, I know I said takeaway, but I have, more, I have one more thing to ask you. We do. Seen, like, a more equitable representation of women in whiskey, mm. in various roles, and that's definitely affecting the, the climate of spirits in the world, I think. Um, but as a woman in this world, also, being, also allowing yourself to give us your knowledge and your palate and your perspective, how do you see that evolving over time? I think that's something that I've been really proud to be part of. There are some amazing women in this industry, and I think there have been for a long time, but they, they were more hidden away. And so finding a mentor for me like Nancy Fraley, um, Marlene Steiner, our brand director, they, they're very passionate about what they do, and that authenticity comes through in a, in a fearless way. And I think that's inspiring. And so for me, I'm hopeful that there's a confidence building because – we know we can do a really awesome job. We have something to say and contribute, whether it's our palate or our knowledge or just a curiosity about the world that we can be experimental into new areas that haven't been thought of. So uh, yeah, it's kind of a, a gender blind fearlessness that I'm excited about. That's amazing. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to shed some light on? Uh, Erica might have something to add. Our website is a great resource, beadistillery.com. We have cocktail recipes on there and information about our whiskey. And uh, we're also available. I'm Amanda at beadistillery.com. Erica, same thing at beadistillery.com. So we love to answer questions, give feedback. So we're, we're really passionate about what we do. And we want to be open to thoughts or questions you all might have. Yeah, well, I mean, thank you so much for your time. I'm, I'm going to add one little tidbit, considering yeah, yeah. our current COVID state, that if anyone is working with retailers or clubs or groups that do want to do some kind of virtual tasting or engagement, we can do that and reach out to me and we can set it up. We have to be creative while we can. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Erica. Thanks. You've always been so supportive for us in the market, and we're really lucky to have you guys uh, at our fingertips. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Cheers to you all. Yeah, cheers to you guys. We look forward to taking this very, very young journey of American Single Mall with you guys, and we thank you for your time. Jessica, Martin, Nicole, do you guys have anything you'd like to uh, share with our esteemed colleagues? <laughs> no, thank you for your time. Thank you. Nice to see you. Yeah, I'm here from the beautiful yeah. uh, Blue Ridge Mountains and uh, <laughs> tasted actually the new single malt, the uh, coaching commission is drinking really, really well. So congratulations on that, guys. And thanks for being here. Thanks for all the information. This is great. Thank awesome. you. Enjoy. Awesome. Makes me happy. Thank you. And I have to say, we're always so proud to represent you guys. You guys are in the market, you know, everywhere from Whiskey Fast and winning awards. And um, so you are a true partnership to us at Winebo. So we appreciate everything that you give us and all the materials and it helps. And it's a true partnership. So um, thank you for your time. And we just love seeing you guys. I feel like every time I look around, it's an award or a press or something. So you guys are doing a great job and we appreciate it all. And just to be able to have this relationship directly with you guys, I know you're very busy. So thank you for making the time. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you very much. Godspeed. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Drink tons of whiskey responsibly. <laughs> and um, we'll, be, we'll be in touch. 
Thank you guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.